So as Nathalie said just before, we are going to talk about today about a project that we did during our gap year. So between April to July of this year. And so the name of this project is CC Cord for Climate Change, Commons and Radical Democracy in Europe. Uh, yes, maybe just to introduce ourselves. So my name is Lea. It's Claire. Yeah, my name is Claire. <laughs> it's almost the same, but not really. And we are currently studying uh, ecology at the National Museum of Natural History. So in Paris, in Jardin des Plantes. I don't know if you heard about this, uh, this place and it's a, a transdisciplinary uh, master, we can say. And so we did this project between the, the first year of our master degree and the second year. And yes, we did it by our own, we can say. And I think yeah, we will explain it um, a bit afterward, but we wanted to know if some of you heard about comments and if you've heard of it, maybe you can stand up so we can see. <laughs> Sorry to move your body. Thank everyone. Okay, so perfect. And um, so you can sit down. <laughs> um, has anyone heard about radical democracy? I suppose yes, but do you believe in it and do you want to look into it a bit more? Radical democracy, you can stand up. <laughs> Again, I promise just three things. So nobody. Uh, wants to know more about radical <laughs> democracy? <laughs> yes. Okay, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> and one last one that is not on our presentation is municipalism. So as if anyone <laughs> heard about it or wants to know more about it, you can stand up one last time. <laughs> municipalism, municipalism. Okay, okay. great, thank there you very much. <laughs> so. Okay. You don't do this one? Okay. It's <laughs> <really> <laughs> <the last> one. <laughs> so we, we wanted, if it's fine with you, to share with you a bit some of our in the, the initiatives we, we've seen, about like 45 minutes. So we, we seen, we've seen a lot, a lot of initiatives. And we want to have some time after for you to discuss in small groups about some initiative or places that we've presented that inspired you. And if you see some links with um, things that happen in your country or things you've heard about, so to make it a bit more uh, <coughs> discussion and then go back like, like this and see what uh, has emerged from your discussion and debate with us if we have time. So we will try to make it very quick and you will have everything, the presentation and all, uh, we'll send it to you afterwards. Yeah. So is that fine with you? This. Wait, okay. <laughs> perfect. <laughs> yeah. And maybe just to add something, uh, we are French people, so we are talking from a French point of view also and from a European point of view. So sometimes if I don't know something, it uh, seems to be a kind of unfair for you, I don't know. Just don't hesitate also to share it because yeah. Uh, no, maybe just after. So uh, to sum up a little bit about the project, so we traveled in 15 cities uh, and we crossed nine countries during four months. So it's short, but it's also very long when you don't have a lot of break, you can say. Mm -hmm. And uh, we uh, met around uh, 100 people. It was activists, elected people, uh, scientists, journalists and also, yeah, citizen initiatives and everything. So just anyone who can talk about uh, radical democracy and those kind of, um, of subjects. And maybe, yeah, we can just show you this little video which can maybe just sum up the different uh, cities we, <laughs> we cross. Oh, the noise is phew. So Naples. <laughs> Sleepy Roma. Yeah. We Okay. 
Okay, mm -hmm. so there is not Barcelona and Madrid because we did it at the end, and also because you saw another person, person <laughs> on the video. It's Hugo because actually we created this project. We were three, and now he's just traveling in Iraq, and I don't know where he's actually for now. <laughs> and we'll be in India next week or something like that in two weeks. Yeah, and so here you can find so the map. And at the end of each uh, cities, uh, of each city, sorry, uh, we wrote different newsletters to just sum up uh, the different uh, people we met and the different things also we discovered. So you can find it on the website of Climates. And yeah, there is one newsletter for each um, each city. Yeah, we also wrote articles for the Green European Journal. So. These are in English, but in the, our newsletter in French and in English. And we tried to mix a bit theory with uh, the interviews and the thing we, we saw uh, on, the, on the field. Yeah, I don't know if you heard about the Green European Journal. It is the journal of the Green European Foundation, which is the foundation of the Green European Party. But the journal is independent. It's important. <laughs> Yeah. It's okay. Yeah. So briefly, Climates is um, a French organization that was created in 2011. Um, there are different part of it that are in Mali, Nepal, Indonesia, Austria, and it's more focused on raising awareness about climate change and making the youth more uh, able to to have a voice in international uh, institutions. And so there there are different. Uh, <coughs> Parts, advocacy, empowerment, and research, and we managed to put our project in the research uh, program of climates and to get the funds from the uh, DEAR program of the European Commission. So we had to make a lot of communications. That's what, why you saw TikTok and other stuff, just yeah. for you to understand the context. <laughs> so briefly, maybe, so we, we wanted to to understand um, not just in France, but how Europe respond to the democratic crisis, ecological crisis, and social justice crisis. I guess you you all you are here also to hear about it, and we don't have to convince anyone. But so our what we wanted to to see in particular was how, how different democratic spaces exist in Europe and how they manage to change things for real, and how they interact with public institutions. Yeah. And so, yeah, um, the aim of this project was to meet so different actors who are experimenting uh, radical democracy, uh, and also inclusive forms of democracy. And it was also about the fact of reappropriating uh, resources and, and power to construct a post-growth society, so you can say this kind of word. And, yeah. and maybe you can talk about yeah. the, the approach. And to, con to build this project, we wanted to hear about uh, the actors we, we already knew to see what they wanted us to go and search for. And so we tried to co-construct in the brief time we had the, some questionnaires and, uh, and it was also to reinforce the links that already exist in Europe. And then now we are going to, to talk about it in different collectives in France but also in Europe. And so yeah, and we especially focus uh, on different democratic tools, we can say. So commons, municipalism, citizen assemblies, energy cooperatives and local uh, referendums. So we are going to talk about each one and to give you some specific examples. It was really hard just to choose one example each, each time, but I think it was good. So the comments do, so is there someone that wants to, to tell us what it is, if you have a definition of your own? If you don't, it's fine, but no, no one? So <laughs> we can. <laughs> 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 so I, I guess so you've heard of it, but we, we just wanted to, to recap it. So it's how a community uh, gathers and decides of rules to use and access uh, a resource. So that's kind of the definition of Eleanor Strom, so the first woman to win the Nobel Prize in economics. But it's also more than a resource, it's a common action and it's a way to change things and to scale up also. It's not uh, just a local thing you do. 
Um, so to illustrate this uh, democratic tool, as we said, we wanted to talk to you about Italy. So maybe you know that there is a big movement in Italy about the commons that started in uh, 2008 in a context of economic crisis with a lot of austerity plans and uh, massive privatization of public services. So there, were a, there was a commission, a commission, um, Rodota, Rodota, I don't know how to say this, uh, on the introduction of common goods in the civil code, but it uh, didn't succeed, but it started a movement of some jurists that gathered with a mobilization of the cultural sector, and they then occupied Teatro Valle in Rome to like test the reflections they had uh, on the field and to face it with practice. And it inspired a lot of different cities in Italy. W one of the um, most famous is Napoli, with the Beni Comuni, so Common Goods Network. The first common good to be recognized was the ex Asilo Filangieri, that was a former convent. And um, they started to occupy the place in 2012. And because the popula population was uh, very, very mobilized, they managed to establish a dialogue with the municipality, which was, which was like um, a municipality okay with those kind of things because it was a civic list with one of the deputy that was focused on common goods and who was one of the jurists of the Commission of Data. So it was already a good, uh, a good place for them to, to dialogue. And then they managed to be recognized as a common good. So the place was recognized as a common good by the municipality. And after that, what's really interesting in, from my point of view is that they managed to be recognized as a uh, an informal community with a self-governance. So there's two things, being recognized as a place of common good, but also on the governance. And to be recognized as an informal community that has its own governance, it is possible with the declaration of urban and collective civic use, which is a new tool they invented with some jurists, of course, but also from some uh, law that is uh, from the Middle Age or something like that. And uh, after that, they inspired other uh, places. And in Napoli, there are now 13 to be recognized as uh, common goods. So you can see some of the values they, they defend. So urban regeneration, auto-organization, cooperation, anti-sexism, anti-fascism, uh, being inclusive and, and free, <coughs> the civic profitability and not uh, economic profit, uh, profitability, these kind of things. And so these are some examples. And for you to see how big they can be in Italy, they don't have social services. And this is why those places gain a lot of legitimacy because they answer needs of the population. You can see a gymnasium, a bar, a health care place, uh, also a place to assist refugees. It's really big, big uh, stuff with a lot of activities. And this one was a former judicial psychiatric hospital with the cells you can see still upstairs. And then briefly, so there are comments in Bari. Um, Villa Rote is a self-organized refugee community, so you'll have the, the presentation to look a bit into it if you are interested. Uh, in Bari, also, there is Bread and Roses with the municipalist vision, and uh, they also are practicing urban agroecology. In Flore Firenze, Florence, there is Mondeggi Bene Comune, which is a farming community struggling to be recognized as a common, and that is now recognized as a common because, or thanks, or because, I don't know, it depends on the point of view, of a European fund. Because there is a European fund to get the money, they had to be legalized by the municipality. But everyone wasn't, uh, not everyone was uh, okay with this. That also, that's also interesting. In Rome, there are a lot, a lot of occupations, and one of them was Lucia y Siesta, a feminist and transfeminist occupation, which is not legalized yet. There is Porto Fluviale ma that managed to be recognized also thanks to work of the university, uh, of the architectural university. So that's also interesting on how university can help those places to be legalized and to get fund, funded. So in Rome, you, 
you could you can check this if you're interested in there is a big map with every occupation and and uh, some categories and all it's really there are really a lot of them and now I'll let Leah speak about Brussels hmm. Okay, I wasn't ready for that. <laughs> but, yeah, okay, I can talk about commons. Uh, so yeah, also in Brussels there is well, there are a lot of there is a lot of commons, sorry, and especially one which is a kind of really different from the one we can yeah discovered in Italy because they have um, employees and at the beginning they were just uh, doing squats and finally they discover also that there is a there was a real need because a lot of people were looking for a place to sleep and also a lot of organization uh, were looking for a place to to, to work sorry and um, so uh, they decided to occupy uh, at the beginning private uh, buildings and then uh, to work with municipalities and to do how do they define it? Yeah, temporary occupation with social purpose. So it is not a uh, long-term occupation, but it's really during um, a specific uh, time. And the idea is then to implement also a new way to occupy this place. For example, um, in some place, uh, some women um, can be there and to live uh, there, um, single women uh, with their children. And the idea is that when uh, this is not the commune uh, who is, uh, which is um, managing the place, and when it's the municipality, the idea is that those people can stay in this place also. Sorry if it's not really clear, but uh, it's too, too fast. It's too, yeah, it's too big, this one. I think the, yeah, the more important thing yeah, and they also decided now to create a foundation to try to buy the, the place and so to be really the, the owners of it and so to do not temporary but really long-term uh, occupation and to change really the occupation of the place uh, finally. Yeah. Um, then we have in Budapest, Cargonomia, and it's interesting because they're in an um, illiberal democracy. So it's how commons can be a counterpower in this kind of, of um, regime. They, they have a, an organic farm and also um, a bicycle self-repair workshop, a self-organized courier service for the organic farm. So yeah, you can look into it a bit more. We, we won't have time to, to develop everything. And they really advocate uh, degrowth. It's really yeah. maybe you know Vincent Liger. He's one of the French uh, people that work on degrowth, and he's in Budapest. Yeah. Uh, so now, yeah, you can do, 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 discover yeah, the. Maybe what I didn't say about commons in Napoli is that it's a place where they can experiment other forms of politics, and it's not just the commons. It's what can <laughs> emerge from this. There, there were um, different municipalist platform. For example, Massa Critica, also uh, Porera Populo, was born in one of the Beni Comuni places, so the common good places. So it's interesting to see how some spaces emancipated from the municipality can create new things and influence the municipality with now also a common good <coughs> observatory uh, financed by the municipality, uh, common good observatory in which citizens can say uh, what they think about the politics of the municipality, about so social justice, environment, and also a common good. Yeah. <laughs> you said the building occupations are either legalized in the end or they are fighting for that. What is the legality of the occupation initially? Is it illegal or is it gray? Or, or does it depend on mm. the city? <coughs> Uh, it depends on the state, but it's in Italy, in Brussels, in France, in Germany, it's illegal. Yeah, so they can be pulled out. But in in Italy, there are a lot of public spaces that was, were just abandoned, and so sometimes they are not fighting with the police, or they are just letting them there and occupying for 20, 30 years. In Rome, you you will see on the map if you you go check on it, a lot of places are illegal, but there and legitimate because they are there for a long, long time but it's not a very stable 
Yeah, but the difference with Napoli is that um, thanks to this, how can I say? Yeah, I mean, well, actually they succeeded in becoming legal and to recognize the informal structure. So now in Napoli, it's legal to, so for, for example, the asilo or ex Capene, it's legal, really. But the, um, the, the, the community stays uh, informal, and this is the most important thing. So they just don't have to create an organization or to have a president or I don't know. Just they can stay here. The municipality uh, pays the electricity, the water, and yeah. But in Roma, it's really, it's not at all the same thing and then can be expelled um, at any time. And the, the project I talked about that were funded by the EU, to be funded, they had to create an association, an organization, a legal structure recognized by the European Commission. And it's not the same as the common goods in uh, Napoli that are just informal community with self-governance. So that's also the, the difference. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, sorry, this is my first question to, uh, to, to, to the term. So I what would be the difference between commons and squads? Uh, so in the commons approach, it's really that you, you create in, with assemblies, horizontal assemblies, the rules all together. It's really the horizontality that is uh, the most important thing. At least in Italy, you can have different commons with different rules, but there is really a, a will to be horizontal and to redistribute the power and to at least in the ones we, we saw. You can have different comments that are categorized by searchers that are more uh, structured than this or with more conventional structures, but I don't know. Yeah, and maybe sometimes, I don't want to be, <laughs> to make the squatters angry, but it can be squatting for squatting and not for creating kind of common place with uh, common rules and yeah everything like that, just to create a new way to, to, to work together and to create a kind of new, yeah, new society. If you can, yeah. <laughs> you can use work like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we can answer your, your question also at the end. So. <laughs> mm. Yeah, okay, about citizen assemblies. So this is a kind of new trendy word, we can say. And, but it's on not really often, um, how can I say? Mm. Uh, sometimes it can be a really democratic washing. So we try to, to, to prevent that. And so maybe do you heard about citizen assemblies? How can you define it? Uh, a real citizen assemblies? What are the main principles or? That's really hard. <laughs> Nobody has heard of citizen assemblies in his or her home country. Yeah. <laughs> so we're talking about what makes them truly citizen assemblies yeah. is that the vote of the people is not um, pondered mm -hmm. or texturized by their wealth. So everyone, depending independently of where they are in the social structure, have the same weight, which doesn't happen in normal democracy where people who have more money have more political heft to them. Okay. Yeah. It will also play the part is that um, it's, it concerns only, uh, it only um, brings together the people, or only the people vote who are actually concerned with the issue. So it's not that everyone votes on something, but only the people that are concerned vote on the issue. Right? So it's very local okay. based, I would say. Okay, interesting. <laughs> and you've heard about the French one? Maybe, and what is the the most important critic that we've that has been made on it? Do you know? Yeah. Macron did not execute the results mm -hmm. of the assembly. Yeah, this is the main issue. <laughs> that can be. So that's one of the main mm -hmm. issue we we've heard about in the different cities we we've traveled to. So we can say, first of all, that, that since this Convention Citoyenne pour le Climat, uh, a lot of uh, citizen assemblies 
um, we are created in Europe, uh, especially. So this is, we can say, the positive point on the one hand. Um, but how can we define it? So assemblies, this is enfin, yeah, this is an assembly that brings together uh, randomly selected everyday people. So this is really something important. Um, and so to learn to deliberate and to make recommendations on different topics, for example, on climate crisis. And so we, wait, this is your computer. We especially, especially uh, talk with uh, Magali Plovi. So we, who was at this time the president of the um, French speaking uh, Brussels Parliament. I don't know if some of you uh, come from Belgium, but it's really something <laughs> really hard to understand just the different administrative levels. And so this is at the scale of uh, the, the region, so Brussels capital region, and at the scale of Brussels Parliament. And so they created uh, those deliberative mixed commissions. It was in 2020. And so those commissions are mixed. So it means that um, there are uh, 15 members uh, of the parliament and also uh, 45 um, randomly selected citizens. And so they have uh, five sessions often to debate and formulate uh, policies uh, and recommendations. And the most important thing is, is that those uh, recommendations uh, then uh, can be followed up by the, by the parliament. Uh, who also uh, participate to the, to the writing and to the, the deliberative uh, part. And they have already uh, addressed six topics, so about 5G, homelessness, homelessness sorry, citizen participation in times of crisis, uh, biodiversity, work in training and noise uh, in cities. And so uh, what are the, the strengths uh, of um, those assemblies it the is the fact that they are permanent. So it's not only a punctual event, for example, like the <coughs> CCC. So it's really an... <laughs> like in France. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. Convention sociale pour le climat, sorry. It's really an institutionalized uh, process and also they are mixed so with the parliament and so it's really, it's easier just to, to follow up uh, the, the implementation uh, of, uh, of the recommendation and yeah. I think. Quick clarification. Do these citizen assemblies have um, a legislative initiative or are they merely consulted or are they merely merely consulted? No, it's really, really they have uh, concrete um, values. So, so then there is law. Okay. So this is yeah the this is not only about uh, a consultation, it's really de deliberative and if taking decisions. I can intervene. I was part as a researcher of the National Citizen Convention for as Assembly, and it was very consultative. I mean, very consultative, but some other assemblies have uh, more power, like in uh, Ireland, or they participate to, uh, participated to the fact that the law on abortion, on abortion was passed. I mean, uh, they are very different regime. But in France, we resisting very much to this form of democracy. I mean, we're making good examples, but not following afterwards. Yeah, yeah, because sometimes those kind of assemblies can be really dangerous because citizens can be really hopeful. And at the end, when the recommendations are not just implemented, they are really disappointed. And they're just like, OK, so just impossible to change every anything. So it can be. Yeah, something really wrong. So sometimes it's better just to not set up and to implement it if, if it's to, to do it wrong. Maybe you can talk about Bologna or? Yeah. Um, one other citizen assembly that was interest, interesting is the one of Bo in Bologna, so in Italy. Um, the first citizen assembly started on April. So we, we arrived just at this time. And it's one of a lot of citizen assembly that are to come because now citizen assembly is recognized as a democratic tool in the status of the municipality. Because in Italy, the, the municipalities have uh, some kind of constitutions that we don't have in France. I don't know if in your countries we, you have more power at the local level, but it's the case in Italy. 
So now citizens can demand a citizen assembly one per year, but also the municipal uh, councillor can also demand a, um, a convention, an assembly. And the first one was on climate. And it was interesting because since 2018, <coughs> a lot of struggles, <coughs> there were a lot of struggles on environment, climate, urgency, emergency, sorry. And it's just four years after that that uh, an answer was given by the municipality. And because the Coalizione Civica, that is a municipalist movement, uh, managed to get into the majority uh, in the municipality, in the city hall, in the municipality. But for that, they allied with the PD, which is a centrist uh, liberal party. And as they managed to push the citizen assembly, they also voted with the PD for the highway widening, mm -hmm. and which is why it was a bit, a bit complicated for the, the activists and all to follow the lead of the coalition at Chivica. And the citizen assembly became a new way for those um, organization and all to be heard in the in a more broad public debate because they, they were not heard in on the streets through their protest protestation and all to the protests sorry uh, having a citizen assembly gave them a way to to express um, their needs at the, and <coughs> their revendication so it's interesting to see how different tools and different actions can be complementary and how it was important to have someone in the, the city hall that pushed something, even though they also voted for a highway, but also at the same time you have to have so, uh, civil society to push uh, on the street and also with the citizen assembly. So it's one of the initiatives we, we thought was interesting to show this complementarity. And if you want to know more about the citizen assembly in Europe, maybe you've heard about the Knowledge Network on Climate Assembly. That is a network of researchers and activists that organize workshops, events, and also reports. Uh, a lot of them are already uh, really good and interesting and go into details. And they compare different citizen assembly on different uh, topics. So also how policy actors are acting and following up the the proposal that came from climate assemblies. Maybe you've heard also about uh, the Conference for the Future of Europe that took place between April 2021 and May 22. Uh, it gathered 800 randomly selected European citizens. A lot of European and national panels were organized and they managed to get a lot of proposals, so 49 and some concrete measures. But it was also a, um, a lot, it gets a lot of critics. Um, one thing I thought was interesting is that now citizen panels are uh, recognized to be a tool in the policy making processes at the European level. But um, this coalition, Citizens Take Over Europe, thinks that it was too consultative and uh, that they did, they did not implement the revendication and the proposal of the citizens. And so it's citizen washing, basically. And so if you're interested uh, to get a bit deeper into it, they gather, this coalition gathers a lot of organization all around Europe, and they uh, advocate for permanent European citizen assembly, and also to have a more binding European citizen initiative. Maybe you've heard of, of it. It's a way to propose new new laws by gathering signatures from uh, different countries in Europe. But it's just also to put to the agenda of the Commission a topic, but it's not binding at all, so they want to make it more binding. No, maybe you, you'll see this on your own. <laughs> okay. So what about local referendums? So have you ever heard about it? How can you define it? Or I don't know, <laughs> just say something about it. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. Well, it's a very naive conception is that it's uh, like a direct vote on a particular policy by citizens. And then 
begun with the major pattern of the Austin Dunn that makes sense for the president, which is like for a specific public that the production thing is uh, useful, but the public has more autonomy too. Yeah. And do you know countries where they use it often? To have one here in Paris very recently about the um, scooters, like the scooters. Mm -hmm. uh, but I'm not sure if that's common to do it, at least at the local level. There was also one in Berlin about whether the city should be climate neutral by 2020. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's significantly earlier than it was planned by yeah. the national government. But it failed. Yeah. <laughs> It's okay? Okay. Um, so uh, we work on that subject, especially in Germany, because there is also uh, Switzerland, uh, which is really famous for, for local referendums. And so it is really an example of direct uh, democracy, and especially in Germany, because, so we can read, uh, it gives uh, the, to eligible Berliners the opportunity even out, outside the framework of regular election to decide directly on certain issues and to adopt, for example, legislation. And which is really interesting is that in Germany, um, citizens can be at the origin of the, um, <coughs> the implementation of this referendum. For example, in France, uh, this is not, it doesn't start uh, from citizens. It comes from administration, from municipality, and everything. So this is the really the main difference. Uh, so here you can, because yeah, maybe just to and um, the organization of and the, the all the process is really different in Germany because it depends on the the lender. And so for Berlin. Because Berlin is a state city, so <laughs> this is the same uh, abilities as the um, lender. And so here you can find all the process you have to follow if you are citizens and you want to, to, to implement uh, local referendums. So first of all, you have to, su to submit it to Berlin Senate's Department of the Interior and Sport and with a budget estimation. And then you have to collect signatures so um, 20,000 and only in paper form. So it's really hard even when, well, often when it's raining, they told us that <laughs> it can be really, really hard. Uh, then the Senate, I can see, I don't know how to place myself. <laughs> uh, the Senate um, verifies so the conformity of the signatures and also um, the contability of the reform with the, the, le the le legislation sorry, um, of the, the city. Uh, ta -ta -ta -ta. Then there is the second, the second phase, and so the citizens have to collect even more signatures. So you can see the different, um, so 100, 1,000, no, 170,000 signatures. So it means 7% uh, of local voters. And also there is a difference if the referendums involve uh, changing the constitution of the city, they have to collect uh, even more um, um, voters, we can say. And finally, so um, the, the administration uh, also uh, must organize the referendum if uh, they consider that all the previous process um, had been respected. And so finally, uh, the referendum can be organized and to, to, to be successful, uh, there is a specific condition, okay, uh, again. So the yes uh, must be a vote. Um, yeah, yes, vote must be supported, sorry, by so numerous citizens. And also it is not the same numbers, if um, the same percentage, sorry, uh, if there is a modification in the constitution or not. So here you can say we can participate and it's not really inclusive because it's only about um, um, citizens eligible also to vote. So for example, when you don't have papers or things like that, you, you are homeless people, for example, it's not possible for you to vote. And there is uh, two types of uh, local referendums. Uh, so one, um, when citizens really um, propose a, a draft law, so it's um, really, you have ready to be 
Um, um, how can I say? Uh, to do it, no, yeah, to be helped, yeah, sorry. Um, to do it, yeah, with the lawyers, or you can uh, propose just a list, so with uh, different uh, bullet points, so it's easier to, to write it, but also then the administration can just kind of do what she wants to do. And so uh, we can talk about, we'll talk about climate, um, climate neutral one just after, but the, the one of the most famous what about, was about a uh, bike referendum. If someone <laughs> speaks German, you can say uh, <laughs> I don't know, I'm sorry. Um, and so it was organized by uh, a network of, of, of different organizations, about bike organization, but also Greenpeace and climate organization. So the name of the network is uh, livable cities networks and now um, it's called uh, changing cities and so they decided to to propose a, a draft law so about um, for a mobility law we can say and they um, in 2016 uh, they collected uh, so 100,000 uh, signatures so it's really huge and it was a, a specific uh, political context because um, it was also uh, during uh, local election and so slow mobility was really uh, an important subject at this time in, in Berlin. And finally a new coalition uh, took power in Berlin and it was really a left-wing um, left coalition so composed of the Greens, of radical left, of social democrats so uh, finally, in 2018, the draft law, so the mobility, the mobility law, uh, was finally adopted. Uh, so by the, the Chamber of, uh, of Representatives uh, of Berlin, and so they didn't have uh, to to implement finally a local referendum because the the local authorities just decided to to create a law and to adopt a law. So it's really a, a big uh, victory. And then this uh, kind of uh, process and movement was um, adapted in different uh, cities in, in Germany. And so we can say that there is about 20 cities that, that now, for, uh, sorry, uh, in Germany that try to implement those kind of uh, referendum uh, about um, about mobility and we can say that this movement is called a uh, will decision so Radenstein we can say and yeah if you want to see but just the video it will repeat what I said but if you want more information you can just um, look at it later yeah. yeah you can put the subtitles because it's in German and yes yeah, so as we talk, so we also met people to talk about uh, the referendum, the local referendum organized about climate neutral Berlin in 2030 or, yeah, 30. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so uh, it was um, a failure because they didn't manage to get enough, enough uh, signatures. Uh, ta -ta 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 -ta. Uh, and finally, one about uh, the expropriation of Dutch Wunen and Co, which is one of the biggest uh, German property companies, and it was really a success. But today, it's not the it's not a left wing coalition. It's uh, the coalition is composed in Berlin of the Social uh, Democrat. So this is the left, the central left, we can say, and the um, CDU. So the Christian one. So they don't know if, because they proposed bullet points, so it wasn't uh, a draft law, so they don't know if today it will be finally implemented or what it will look like. But they might organize a new referendum with the draft law to be more binding, and it's really a big, big thing, really interesting in Europe. Yeah. So the struggle um, is not finished. More. Um, energy cooperatives, have you already heard about those cooperatives? <laughs> yes. Yeah, I think they are an, an association like activity that try to, I mean, 
they uh, administrate or actually have to properly renewable energies project, uh, usually solar panels that are quite can be more uh, affordable for communities. And I think they usually provide energy to themselves, and if they produce more energy, they can sell it to the grid than everyone who invested before profit from the energy generated. So the profits on good terms, but the citizens that are part of the property. Yeah, you have really a lot of different types of energy cooperatives. We've seen quite a few of them, so I will just present to you um, one of them in Berlin, so Burger Energy Berlin. Uh, at the beginning, the <coughs> citizen movement wanted to get the contract um, of the operation of the grid because the concession to a private company was um, coming to an end. But they, they failed, and it's a public company that got the contract. So it's not that bad to have a public company instead of a private one. But the Burger Energy Berlin thinks that the citizens are not uh, heard uh, on this operation of energy and all, and that it could be better if a cooperative of citizens could manage it. And now they are more focusing on producing solar energy and trying also to advocate at the, uh, the administration level to make uh, other um, decision-making process that it implicates citizens in this uh, public company that operates the grids. Um, one other example is Giacapene factory in Florence in Italy. Actually, the, the workers were fired illegally in 2021, and since then, they are occupying the factory. So it was a, a Fiat factory, so a um, car factory in Florence, and they are trying now to, to make a cooperative that produces solar panels. So it's really hard because they are struggling, they are not paid, they are supported by different uh, other movement in, in Florence and in the region, like Mondeggi Bene, uh, Bene Comune, that I, I spoke about before, uh, that is focused on agriculture, so they, they are doing uh, um, food for them and supporting the, the big uh, protests they organize. Through Italy, they organize protests to support this uh, occupation, so it was really a big thing when we arrived, and now that they they have gathered uh, the amount of money they, they wanted to, to have with the crowdfunding. So I don't know how they are managing, but it's uh, it seems to be working. And there is a movie, if you want, it's in Italian, but if you want, we, we put a lot of movies in this presentation, if you want to go further. Uh, I don't know if, if it's easy to find it. I'm not on sure. Your I think this one is really hard to, but if you want to, yeah, to, to share it and to, organize a, a, a presentation of this movie is possible, but you have to, to contact the, the person who created the movie. Uh, Collectivo di Fabrica, mm. you can contact them if you want. And in France, um, just a few mm. minutes, there is a network that is called Energie Partagée, so shared energy, that um, <coughs> is supporting, federating, and financing citizen projects that produce re renewable energy all around France. And uh, in Nantes, so it's a city in the, uh, on the west coast, uh, there is the first local non-profit supplier of energy since like just July this of this year. Um, it's recognized by the ministry to be a supplier. They are trying to organize themselves, it's not working already. And they also have a water mill, so they'll, they will be a supplier and also producer of renewable energy. And at the European level, if you're interested in this topic, there is RESCOP, RESCOP, no, <coughs> Federation of Citizen Energy Cooperative that is advocating at the European level to have legislation um, that encourage, uh, encourages energy cooperatives. 
one difference that can be interesting to understand a bit this um, like framework. big uh, <coughs> framework. Uh, different kind of cooperatives you have. There is two uh, big category that are described and defined by um, the directives of the European Parliament. It's uh, the citizen energy communities and the renewable energy communities. And actually, it's the second one, so the renewable energy communities that are more local and democratic because you can't have uh, a big company from far away that invents, invests in the cooperative. You must have local, um, local, but they don't define local, but at least it has to be local and not a big one, just small or, I don't know if you say in English, uh, moyen, middle companies. Um, mm -hmm. that can invest and uh, you also have to that the, the production must be uh, close from the place that where you you will uh, distribute it uh, and you have to have a democratic governance and those criteria are not um, demanded for the citizen <coughs> energy communities so it can be a bit uh, confusing <coughs> but if you want to know more about it on RESCOV there is a lot of of stuff uh, about it. Okay. <coughs> yeah, I think this is the last one. So, what about municipalism? I think that at the beginning, uh, not anybody uh, was aware of this tool. So maybe if someone heard about it, about yeah, anything. What do you think it can be? I don't know. Yeah. No, <laughs> nothing else. So it's not really, okay, famous. It's interesting to know. Uh, so we can say that also, um, especially in Italy and in Spain, in Spain, uh, they use the word uh, platform to talk about uh, the gathering of citizens. And so it's often municipalism, it starts from uh, social movements for activists and from citizens in general, in general uh, who are actually not really happy with the way we are doing um, um, policies and uh, especially they are against the old parties and the um, separation and the, the opposition between the left wing and the, the right wings. And so they try to, to take the power at the local level and so to transform the way we can do politics and to be so even more inclusive and to do politics for, by and with citizens. So we can say that it is a, a bottom up movement. And then uh, in 2017, was created the Fearless Cities Network. So you can see the, the map just here that you can find on the, I think there is, yeah, there we go. Uh, so um, uh, on the website of the European Municipalist Network, so which is a network about um, municipalism in Europe. And so you can see that in all those cities, you can find uh, municipalist um, initiatives. And actually to draw the, um, the our, our project and our travel, we really start with this map and um, a lot of them um, really try to take the power at, at the local level but sometimes it's not really something that they want to do for example like in Malmö and so they try to, to, to change politics but outside the institution so there is different kind of strategy and yeah on the website of the European Municipalist Network so EMN um, they describe, um, yeah, they describe different goals. So about what is the, the different goals of municipalism. So first of all, there is the question of the feminization of uh, politics. So it's about giving women and um, more generally, um, more broadly, uh, giving to minorities really a greater role in decision-making process. It's not about only doing. Um, how can I say? Also to to share our 
vulnerabilities and the fact that it's not really always easy to do politics and you don't have to pretend that you are really strong and that it's only for strong people who are a lot of knowledge and everything. It's also about so deploying more radical democratic tools, so everything that we just showed you before, to enable uh, citizens to uh, participate to the decision-making process. Uh, yeah, it's also to fight against the rise of the extreme right so in Europe, because it is a kind of uh, common um, issues. And, so, yeah. okay. and finally, to propose also um, an economy that respects living organisms and planetary limits. Uh, yeah, if you want to read about municipalism, you can read uh, Murray Bouchin. So it's the kind of the, the one we is really talking about it. Classic. So yeah, you can say that. Um, it's an, uh, an anarchist. Next slide. Yeah, I want. <laughs> and so we, the main example is really the one of Barcelona, which is really impressive, and. It gave me a lot of hope when I discovered it. <laughs> and so they um, created a movie just to, to sum up really the campaign of uh, uh, Barcelona in Comú, so which was the name of the platform, and which focused about the, the mayor, so Ada, Ada Colau, uh, which was elected uh, so in 2015 uh, at the, end, uh, at the head sorry, um, of, the, of the city. So yeah. And you can find this movie on YouTube. There is English sub subtitle and it's in, in Spanish and really it's so interesting. <laughs> That's it. So if you want, yeah. So she's just doing civil disobedience. <laughs> um, yeah, so next. Uh, <coughs> was she elected? Yeah. yeah. She was. For two mandates. And they, they lost uh, this year, but they are still in the coalition with the uh, Socialist Party. How can I do just to... <laughs> oh. Okay. So what about the political context? Is it, is it possible to... Uh, how is it possible to, to be elected when you are just 
ordinary uh, citizens, we can say. So first of all, in 2011, uh, I don't know if you heard about it, but a massive movement uh, took place at the beginning in space. So it was called uh, the Indignados movement. And so uh, the idea of this movement was ready to put an end to the uh, be part in the, the opposition between the PP, so the popular party, so really the, the right um, wing party and the PSOE. So the left wing party really is the, the, the traditional parties in, in, in Spain. And so uh, this movement asked really for uh, more democratic policies and that truly meets uh, the, the needs of uh, citizens. And those movement was really close to the, 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 the election because yeah, the, the local election, uh, so which took place in, in May. And so they called for voting uh, neither for the PP and neither for the PSOE, and to ask for just a new way to, 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 do, um, to do politics. And so finally, um, in 2015, so uh, for the, um, the next election at the local level, we can talk about a really a, a municipalist wave <laughs> because a lot of citizen platforms uh, succeeded in taking uh, the head of, the, of different uh, cities in, in Spain. So you have Barcelona, but you also have Madrid, Valencia, uh, Zaragoza. So all this list. And uh, we talk about rebuild cities. This is the way we, we talk about them. And so about especially uh, Barcelona, because we, we went to Barcelona and to Madrid. So we can focus on this example. So in 2014, so before being elected, uh, the creation of, uh, of the movement, so they, there is a publication of their manifesto. And so they, um, this, yeah, we can say that Guan, Guanyem Barcelona, which was the previous name of uh, Barcelona in Commune, was the, the gathering of different uh, social movements. So a lot of people uh, came from uh, the Indignados movement, but also from the right to housing. And for example, Ada Colau was um, the co-founder of the of one of an important um, right to housing movement and a platform called um, the PAH, so LAPA, we say. And also there was a lot of uh, academic and uh, cultural uh, people in this um, first uh, movement. And they, at the beginning, um, succeeded in gathering so a lot of signatures to be supported and also they constructed uh, their program with uh, citizens, so they organized different meetings, committees, and online, online consultation also to create their program. And they wrote an ethical code, so with citizens, uh, to define so the guidelines to be respected by future elected uh, officials. And so finally, uh, the, the name Barcelona in Commune was uh, chosen and uh, they define uh, themselves as a confluence of different movements. Um, of various so left wings and environmentalist parties. For example, uh, Podemos was part of it. I don't know if you heard about it. They were created for the, the European election in Spain at the beginning. And finally, so Barcelona uh, won the election in 2015. And so they had um, 11 seats. And so Ada becomes the mayor uh, in place of Xavier Trias. So she, she said, uh, his name in the in the in the in the trailer, uh, which is a, a centrist, and is now no no <coughs> in the, okay the we okay it's okay um, yeah to obtain the majority they have to create an alliance with the the left wing parties, so the, yeah, they always have to 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 work with also other other parties in Spain. So it's not only about, okay, Barcelona and Comú is at the head of the city and they can do what they want to do. Not at all. They have also to work with other parties because they won thanks to their seats also. And we can, this is always the, the question we can ask, what changes so we can, we can see after eight years in power and a budget of uh, more than two million euros uh, per year. So, for example, there, is, uh, there were changes about wages or reduction 
uh, in salaries for elected people about energy because they created a municipal re renewable energy supplier, which is called Barcelona, Barcelona Energia. Uh, then about also mobility. Um, yeah, Barcelona is really famous for that and especially about super block. You can see a lot of video about it. It's about uh, preventing uh, the use of car um, in, in some streets. You have actually, you cut the city in different blocks of six buildings and in, in each six buildings, it's just forbidden to use your car. And so you can just um, yeah, um, take your car around. So about also citizen participation, they created uh, the citizen uh, platform uh, DCGM Barcelona, which is really famous and also now the kind of the main example in Europe and in, which is really famous internationally and is retaken in a lot of country. Um, and yes, also about uh, tourism, because it's an important uh, issue uh, in Barcelona. <coughs> and how do you do just to, to maintain uh, the fact that you can welcome tourists, but also that people and Spanish people can also have a place to sleep. And yeah, this is really important example, famous and really, we can say, <coughs> ambitious. And it really works. You have really concrete. Uh, element and if you want to have if you want to have really more details about everything in our newsletters it's really really <laughs> well uh, yeah <laughs> because sometimes it's just hard to, to yeah, no, no, no 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 not TikTok <laughs> not TikTok it's only yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah maybe just why do they lost uh, so the local election this year it's because there is uh, actually, in all Spain, uh, the rise of the right and of the far right also. So it is not only an issue in, in Barcelona. Uh, then, actually, they didn't lose a lot of seats because if you remember, in 2015, uh, they won 11 seats. But it's only, they only lost so two seats, but they arrived in the third position. And so they decided to create an alliance so with the PSC, which is the Social Democrat Party. Um, which won uh, 10 seats, so to counter the, the 11 seats of uh, Xavier Trieste, so the previous mayor, and also the entry of the far, far right, so the party is called Vox, and they won two seats, and this is really something new um, in, um, in Barcelona. And so finally, so uh, the PSC, uh, so um, now he's at the end of the, um, of the, of the city. So if the left wing, but the traditional left wing so this is less radical and yeah there is also different reason the fact that uh, the um, they have to play the the um, the game of the alliance and so they have lost also in radicality so for some people for some people there there weren't enough radical there was also the catalan crisis and barcelona just um, advocate uh, the implementation of the referendum, but they, um, Barcelona, uh, yeah, they didn't say if they were for or against uh, the independence of um, Catalan. So for some people, so this unbiased uh, position wasn't, wasn't enough. And yeah, sometimes the results are not really visible uh, in the short term. So people are just like, uh, not a lot of things really change. So. We can just choose um, another one. Yes, no? yeah. So if you want to just to go further, because Barcelona is the main example, but also there is a lot of other interesting examples. So you can check Madrid. This was really another political context, because um, when so uh, Manuela Carmena uh, arrived in power, so always in 2015, it was, uh, I don't remember, but before, yeah, uh, the PP, so the, the right-wing party, was in power uh, since 20 years. So, um, so since 20 years, so it was really a big, big, big surprise. And then they weren't really also ready to win. So it's something interesting. Yeah. And so they lost in 2018. So they stayed only for one mandate. And then outside uh, Europe, uh, 
uh, things all, are also going on. And for example, in Belgrade, uh, so a citizen. Mm, yeah, you can go like, it. Briefly, because we want to have time to discuss with you, but what's interesting outside of Europe is that they are in an author authoritarianism context, and so fighting for uh, ecology is linked to fight for democracy. And as uh, Yelena said to us, she's one of the elected people at the municipal level from the municipalist movement. She said it started as a protest movement for urban commons before becoming a kind of social movement and finally an electoral player. And now we are becoming an official national party. So it started as a fight <coughs> and they just um, um, started a new party in July. <coughs> So if you want to know more about it, there's also a lithium mine with a big struggle in Serbia, uh, the issues of the um, green growth, uh, the role of the European Union in it and all. You can see maybe more on the newslet newsletter and articles. Yeah, and also in Zagreb, the, just the main idea is that at the beginning it starts from Spain and now Spain so a lot of municipalist platforms just uh, lost the, the municipal election, but in uh, eastern countries, uh, for example, so and cities, especially cities like in Zagreb in Croatia. Uh, so um, in 2021, so uh, the, um, the municipalist um, initiative uh, Mojemo so won the, the municipal election. So there is a lot of hope and it's not only in Spain and maybe it's not anymore in Spain but it arrives in other countries and in another also political context. And what is interesting with Mojemo is that they, they really work with uh, scientists uh, to create their program and uh, to define also their ideology. And so this is the Institute of the Political Ecology, uh, which was really at the, um, at the core of the creation of, um, of the party and yeah, of the, the values. And, Everything. And they talk about degrowth also a lot. And this is why in September yeah, of the year, the end of August, they organized, <laughs> so the city organized, uh, so the degrowth conference, so in Zagreb. And I think this is the last one. Yeah, the last one, because we, we've been to national meetings last week, weekend. Uh, to present these uh, European initiatives to um, a network of uh, it's called Réseau Action Commun. It gathers collectives and also lists and municipalities that are doing and practicing um, participative democracy. Um, and if you want to know more about it, there is also a, a movie uh, they did on the last uh, campaign in Montpellier. It's a city in the, the east uh, south, south of France. So yeah, uh, a lot is going to happen since uh, 2026 for the next municipal election in France. And maybe one word, uh, we don't have any more money on this project, but <laughs> uh, if, you, if you want or if you know people that want to travel through Europe and to uh, continue this work, dig into one tool or recreate something but around like democracy and with this uh, political uh, radicality, but yeah, with a lot of... Uh, uh, yeah, it's open. Uh, there is a place to do it with the organization. We have contacts. We can so share them. And but yeah, we don't have money, so you'll <laughs> have to find new new money. But if you know people, this year maybe it's gonna be too short. But next year or whatever, it can be interesting to to keep going this this way of doing also research because what we did inspired the French uh, people we met last weekend. We didn't think it it uh, would interest them that much. But actually, there is something to, to build at the European level, to build or to reinforce, to face also um, the rising of the far right and how cities, and we've been to big cities, but also uh, more small rural cities that can be uh, uh, places to change things and to resist to the far right. Uh, so yeah. Yeah, it's really open to anyone. And mm. you have our contacts, if you, we will send you the presentation. If you have questions, you want contacts on uh, different um, countries, initiative or whatever. The point of this is to, to share and to, for you not to lose as many time as we, 
with lots to dig into, uh, into contact stuff. And so now uh, we have 40 minutes left. Um, so it's as you prefer, or you can discuss in small groups and then we talk uh, about what's, what you've been inspired by and if you, you see some links with other things you, you know about in your countries or in different places of the world, or we can just answer your questions. So we have 15 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sorry if it was a bit short. Um, we hope you enjoyed some, or it was inspiring for you. You will have so the presentation and all. But now maybe we can share uh, some ideas. You can share the ideas you you've talked about in groups. So if anyone wants the mic. <laughs> All right, so I'm just going to try to summarize what we talked about. I think one of the main points of discussions is um, how there seems to be a trade-off of how to engage political ideology with this localized uh, communal work. So what we were talking about is that sometimes it's hard to make this local work um, mean something towards more structural change. But at the same time, if you put too much political meaning into this localized work, it then becomes difficult to engage with people who have different points of view politically and uh, in certain places, maybe not necessarily in Europe, but outside of Europe, would also lead to more political repression. So yeah, the main points for us is how to find a good level of balancing local work in the communes and a more generalized view of political change. You, you don't think that uh, the, the movement in uh, Barcelona and other cities, rebuilt cities, had a major impact at the structural level? You don't think so? Oh, maybe someone from my group can help me. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think... Should I? Yes. So I, th I think that's the point we were discussing. So on the one hand, of course, you, ha you can politicize a movement and then invoke structural change. But at the same time, and apparently, as a person not from a developed country, but apparently in, not, uh, uh, in developing countries, if you over politicize a local movement, it suffers from stronger oppression. Um, for example, we talked about the Philippines and uh, Brazil for that matter. Uh, so there it becomes dangerous to over-politicize a local movement, but then of course structural change is harder. So this is the balance we were discussing, how to find that. Okay, thank you. Yeah. You can read the newsletter on Zagreb if you want to know about it. <coughs> um, so we had... Um, somewhat uh, fractured opinion, but uh, with a consensus in the end. Uh, I'll present um, the first part of the fraction, of the, fra of the fractious opinion uh, of the group, mostly headed by uh, me and not the more reasonable people. Um, <laughs> and that is that the, this um, type of um, uh, the idea of citizen um, democracy doesn't really lead us anywhere, because the, um, at most, for its small, for its uh, difficult, for its difficult in expanding, its um, for its difficult in expanding its scope, it really can't address the cause problem, the the, the um, causal, the, the whatever is causing the big problems. It can only um, um, address the consequences. So, in the in the global in the global political view, it just leads to people wasting their militancy on something that won't really um, affect. The rest of the um, would, would not affect radically the political um, the political situation. The more reasonable people, in, the more reasonable people in the group, though, they think that there is a very important trade-off between scale and um, between scale and impact, and they believe that these things, although they only work in a very small scale, they have very significant impacts in the small scale, and for that they should be thoroughly applauded. <laughs> <laughs> you will be next. Yeah. <laughs>
I just want, I'm in the same group, I just want to say that I <laughs> respectfully disagree with my <laughs> colleague. <laughs> because I do think that one of the uh, root, uh, root causes of the problems we face today is precisely that people cannot decide the, over the, the matters that uh, influence their everyday life. So I think that citizen democracy is important and that we should, it's a, an ideal that we should strive for. It's not something that at the moment is possible, perhaps, but it's something we have to work towards with, I would say. It's like an ideal, it's a utopia that helps us, helps us keep a horizon towards, you know, keep going, going to, you know, that's what I think. Or maybe you can someone. Say. Hi. Uh, like we were in a very specific group, like out of five, four we were not from the European Union. So that I think that gave us like a very interesting driver, uh, driver. And actually, like three of us, we were from Latin America, so we were like thinking about like if we saw these cases in our countries in Latin America and like it was there was a, I mean Montenegro <laughs> and there was a huge debate on that and we kind of like realized that it's uh, if I can make a conclusion it, like it's like the, in the European Union level the local governments have a lot of uh, political power and a lot of independ in independence from the from centralized, uh, from yeah, like from centralized decisions, a lot more than our countries. So even though that, uh, like, even though that there are like some movements or some local movements in our countries, like they're much more um, kind of like uh, like smashed up from top down. Uh, because there is no support and it, like it's very like autori authoritarian uh, societies. So these uh, these cases are like kind of sort of an exception uh, because it's a lot of democracy, a lot of uh, resources, a lot of uh, capital, capital, and yeah, just but we, like there are some cases that are rising up in our societies. Uh, what we uh, really identified was that also that what can propel it is the political structure of a country. For example, in the case of Barcelona, of course, it's a landmark because Barcelona, I mean, Spain has a commu autonomy community, so it allows every community just like to have the rights to implement the, the decrees and law, and they, it is going to be facilitated because of it. But in our cases, we identify that, for example, Mexico has a, um, a federal structure and the case of, Ger of Germany, of course. So it can be more easier to implement and uh, to have those type of initiative. For example, they have mentioned that there are some movements in Mexico and there's also some movement in the case of Mary's country. But in the case of uh, and more centralized countries, like in the case of Montenegro or maybe in Peru, there are just, of course, but there is like a scarcity of, of that type of, um, of communities. But I think like, uh, also, well, maybe it's just uh, trying to go in depth. Uh, what we're trying to say about like what is happening in the European Union, uh, maybe that it's important just to take into account that there are some difference, of course, the European Union and the federalism is important, but also these goals, because they mentioned, they highlight the part of the democracy, that is like a radical democracy, that it goes far than the traditional concept of democracy that was, um, that was of course, proposed, that is not only going to vote, that also can, population can go and can participate indirectly. But also there are some cases like they can be a contradiction that it was mentioned, like the case of Hungary, that it's also a liberalism democracy. So that's all what I wanted to say. Are there other people who want to say something? Is there no more groups left that want to say something? Yeah. I have a couple of <coughs> to say if no one else wants to. I, 
Okay, then I'll just say something. Uh, more, so I, I'm a big fan of uh, municipalism. I, I think that's a really cool thing. I subscribe to uh, this idea very much. But you were also talking a lot about uh, direct democracy. Um, and I wanted to give my opinion on that because I'm, I'm very skeptical about strong direct democratic um, um, facilities, especially on the national level. To give you two examples, I think, for example, the Brexit referendum, which was an act of direct democracy, um, you can see how these things can result to very populist and far-reaching decisions that turn out much worse for the country if, if there would have been maybe a more expertise or a careful approach to the matter. Or for another example in Berlin, there was the uh, referendum of if they should keep the second airport open instead of locate, locating it further south. Um, and the referendum decided to keep open the airport and they closed it anyway. So they were against the direct democratic decision, which in my opinion was the right call because the problem with the old airport was that it was lots of noise, uh, noise uh, for lots of people, whereas the other airport didn't concern anyone. But because most of these people were not most of the voters, it was just decided to keep the airport open, which would have had a terrible impact of people who mostly came from, um, um, from who mostly lived in social housing. It was badly insulated. Instead of uh, the other <coughs> airport, which would have um, struck most, or which strikes mostly wealthier households in one family homes. So I think, for example, if you think of legislation such as uh, reintroducing the death penalty for uh, pedophiles, for example. I'm not sure what the direct democracy vote would be on that, but I could very well imagine that people would be in favor of this, even though it would probably go counter most of the idea of human rights that we have. Yeah, so maybe you could give your opinion on that. <laughs> <laughs> the last uh, part or <laughs> No, no. Just that direct democracy in general, and if you see it as a good tool or... <laughs> but the, the groups that didn't speak, you, you want to share something? We can answer maybe later. You want to? I would have a question to you. Ah, okay, so we can take okay. both questions. We can remember everything. <laughs> <laughs> My question would go um, more to your like personal experience throughout the year because you've traveled around in many uh, countries, you've talked to so many people and I would find it interesting if you have made experiences or t um, gained knowledge that was surprising to you, things that they didn't expect or were like, like did this year more or less confirm the, the assumptions that you had both about like radical democracy or the project that you visited? Yeah. <laughs> Is there anyone that hasn't spoken yet that wants to? Are you sure? <coughs> yeah, my, my remark is also a bit on the, um, on the same vein as uh, Vierna's remark. And when I think about um, historical examples of um, um, binding citizen, citizen assemblies, one of the most clear examples, I think, is the Bolivian constitution of the Roman, of the Roman um, Republic. And the interesting thing about the Bolivian Constitution is, although it had a lot of citizen assemblies, they were very easily co-opted by they were very easily co-opted by the power by people with lots with, by people with lots of money, exactly because they did not have um, organized structures in those in those uh, assemblies. Part of the idea, why, part of the reason why we moved to representative democracy was that the the idea that represent the representative would be uh, for his um, let's say professionalized um, role in politics would be harder to uh, sway or harder to corrupt than just a random citizen picked off um, a lot. And um, that gets even more stronger when we include political parties in the mix because the political party has its own uh, philosophy, its own ideals that should act as a barrier to um, it, fall, it falling prey to the interests of capital. And I would also like to, hear, to uh, know your opinion on how to insulate the citizen assemblies from 
the power of capital in the way that the Roman Republic did not lead into its tragic fall. Okay, well, we have four minutes. So. <laughs> Do you want to say something? Yeah, I can start. <laughs> and we can stay to discuss a bit afterward if, if you want. Uh, at least I can. Yeah. Um, yeah, just maybe first to clarify also about municipalism because you talk about it. Um, I didn't say it, but there is the idea of also of climbing, of climbing the different scales. So the idea is to start from the bottom and then to change politics, but at different levels. So it is not. It is about starting from local because um, they believe that uh, people feel a more confident and also can. It's about also against fi fighting against um, abstention. And they believe that if people are not interesting about politics, it's also because they don't feel part of it. And so when you start from uh, local needs and from everyday life issues, it can be the start of, a bigger, of bigger changes. So yeah, just to, to clarify about municipalism. And then um, about the fact that in Europe, I think it's true, it's really easier to, to to create a municipalist platform. But we didn't talk too much about Budapest and about Croatia and Serbia, but this is really another political context. And for example, in Budapest, this is the Green Party, uh, so which is in, in power in Budapest. And so the national government is Viktor Orban. So this is not really the same uh, reality. And the local Green Party, so they told us that it was really, really hard for them to just to do something because they don't have money because the, the, the party of Viktor Orban's uh, Fidesz just cut uh, the different finance, fin fin money, fin subventions and everything. And also because they, are, they have power, so the national government on the different uh, medias. So they are just saying uh, into it that uh, green party cannot manage a city. It's not that they cannot manage, it's just that just they don't have money, so they can do anything. So it's also sometimes, I think, really in the details. And so uh, sometimes it's just harder to see that there is really, really, really an important issue and that European countries are still working with those kind of countries because they can they define themselves as um, liberal in an economic way, but in the question of, um, how can I say, um, freedom of expression, this is not the same thing, but we just choose to, to accept to, to, to work with them because just for, for money and we just forget this second part. So yeah, just about it. And Maybe to just to start to answer with the question of direct democracy and referendum, local referendum, and the limits of it, um, we uh, didn't have the time to to go in Switzerland, but there is really an important I issue about it. On the one hand, to ask um, each time to citizens to take position on specific subjects, and sometimes you just don't want, you just don't have the time, you are not really well informed, uh, you don't feel really legitimate. Um, so um, this is also the question about when you ask people to give their opinion and to take a decision, how do you uh, raise awareness, awareness uh, what information do you give? So this is yeah, an important subject. And uh, you were talking about Berlin? On that, yeah, because actually in France it was the same issue on the question of airport for Notre Dame des Landes. I don't know if you heard about it, and then there were there was a, an occupation to to fight against the construction of a, of an airport, and the local citizens um, uh, vote for the construction of the um, of the airport. But finally, so a lot of people were against that because even if people were for the construction of the airport, it was against the question of um, common good and just to, to live in a, in a, with equality and everything. <coughs> I don't know how to say it each time just to not be <laughs> this cuckoo, we can say. 
Um, cheesy. <laughs> cheesy. <laughs> and, uh, and finally, thanks to the, the occupation, the, the, the local referendum and the airport was, uh, was cancelled. So sometimes it's just hard to, yeah, there is no position also between different citizens because you're just living in, it was near Nantes. You're like, okay, yeah, it will be really practical if I have another airport just next to me, but you don't really uh, think about uh, ecological issue, inequalities and everything. But if you have also <coughs> a, a time, a, a consultation <coughs> and assemblies to talk to, to confront yourself. And I think this is really important just to create spaces to talk about and to be informed before taking decision. And I, I think also in local referendum, it is forbidden to take decision for, in Germany about um, <coughs> um, this, uh, yeah, penalties, you said? De death penalty. De de death penal penalty. So also you can decide of some rules. And I think that those rules um, have to be decided together. If I can answer. Yeah. If it's time, you can leave, it's OK. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I can try to add some things. Um, we were not, I think, so naive about direct democracy. We wanted to see different kind of ways to put it in place and especially on this point how to get informed and how not to get informed just by experts and all this delegation of knowledge of power and all and what's really um, central is how we reappropriate resources but also knowledge and also decision and it's a triptych like you, you can't have one without the others and obviously a lot of initiatives failed or or have limits and honestly it was really difficult to go and see everything because we were very critical I wanted to understand the limits what what went well what went wrong and I saw a lot of wrong things or I mean disappointing things so that's also to answer your question a lot of things were disappointing but also a lot were inspiring because it's very different there is not one method one way but a different um, at attempt to to do things and not to go in this um, in this way that direct democracy is uh, how can I say that in the negative part you you've described so it's really interesting also the complementarity and it's not one tool that is the thing and it's about also cultural change how we manage to discuss together and it's not just a tool it's how we listen to each other and we can put ourselves at the place of others and of course, the question of the capital and money and redistribution and all, but what strikes me in the comments, especially in Italy, because I didn't know this kind of thing, and Italy is really different, different from France because they don't have public services or social services or not that much. There is a lot of privatization. And actually, it is because the state is not very present that it allows people to be legitimate because they answer needs of people. So. You know, it's a tension, it's not good or bad, but it's because of this context they managed to uh, get in this place that was free or like a uh, void. Uh, but it's not f something we, we can wish for maybe, or I mean, it's just how it, all those perspectives can uh, nourish a vision and that you, you, can't, you don't stay in, but I mean, you're all from different countries, so you, you, you know that, but how we can also inspire ourselves and not stay in our like, um, straight minds. and small minds and yeah. <laughs> so I think that's one thing very interesting and the self-organization how, how we because we are from uh, this museum in Paris Sorbonne University and all the like the weight of academy the elitis, elitism also all the discriminations uh, sexism uh, classism racism how it is very present and how we I uh, at least so different ways to to answer those questions or to question actually the communities the people in inside the communities and how to reappropriate those things and not to leave them to some expert or some laws far away and to be like implemented by police people no how we reappropriate those things those discussions those decisions and how it's really linked to being emancipated from yeah the power and the capitalism and what was really interesting and in how you managed to get your own food 
but not as a like a small thing in your small zone, but how you get this, but you spread it. How in, in Italy they are really open. We, you, you can go there, visit them, help them. You can, everyone is considered. There is a real question of responsibility and also trust. And I think this is inspiring, but of course in the world as we know it, with f strong forces, big companies, corruption, power, money, it's really difficult and it's not one thing like that that can change things, but I think the network of all these different forms can produce something and can resist. And we can see in Italy, it's not because uh, there is Meloni at the power, so the far right, that, but it's also a federal system, so no, not as centralized as other places, but it hasn't changed a lot of things for the self-organized places, social centers, because they, they have kind of an independence. Of course, they don't have money and all, but you see, it's also how you can, it's not a solution, the solution, but it's how all these things uh, together can change a bit something. And if I can add one last thing, um, personally, it's yeah the how the power or is corrupt, corrupting uh, people and how in our communities, organization, we, we can try to see that, to discuss that, because it's, for me, the root of not everything, but I mean, it's really the, the basis of how we can also, in militancy, destroy ourselves, because we are actually going down in those kind of issues, even with little power, there is struggle for it. People sometimes don't look at it, and it's something important for me to look at it. Sexism also, uh, I felt a lot about it, <laughs> even in academic also, I realized how we are constricted. I mean, we already realized something, but it was more present to speak to people situated very differently. So I think one central thing, yeah, it's how we consider each other and it might seem to be really small scale, but you can start with the core that is more open to, to discuss, to consider each other, to deconstruct, <coughs> to then face mm -hmm. uh, bigger issues, but if you're not addressing those issues or at least watching them, discussing about them, because we can't be perfect, it's not about being pure or whatever, but just if you don't choose to see that, then you, you can have municipalist uh, initiative comments, big things that just go down because of one man uh, at the end. And I think that's the more disappointing thing uh, to see how we do a lot of things in the emergency with this masculinity approach, productivist approach in militancy, and then it just goes down. And sometimes I think democracy, but I know it's from a perspective, European perspective, and I don't say that it's easy, but taking a bit more time sometimes uh, can also produce things that you can't quantify, but it will change uh, around. And it's, I think one message of what we, we want of the presentation is that it already exists. And it's not very well known, but a lot of things, different forms of things exist. And it's about in being inspired by all this and, and helping each other, like, without all this uh, frontier. No, how do you say yeah, Frontiers, borders. So yeah, so, uh, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, just yeah, maybe to add that we just a huge uh, stake and need um, <coughs> to link everything. Because when you are just working on your projects, on your initiatives, you just don't have any time to see what is going on just next to you or just in the country, just yeah, next uh, next to your own country. And so we try, <laughs> thanks to our travel, just to try to sum up everything and to to create a kind of knowledge that can be shared, that can be useful to them and maybe to prevent also to 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 yeah to reproduce always the same mistakes and often it deals with domination and yeah things like that and when also when it starts from when it starts from the um, from, from local struggle it's often even more powerful because you you have a kind of legitimacy it's a question no no, no? okay <laughs> sorry <laughs> Someone who wants to say something. Yeah, sorry. It's really sorry late. for this. Like we are here, you are there. It's not very. But we really and we are late, it. and we don't like that. When we <laughs> are just at the end of our lesson, we're like, mm. the teacher is just so, <laughs> yeah, rude. So I don't. <laughs> if you we, we, we want, we can stay a bit there, and if you want to, go, you can. Thank you so much. Thank you.